Okay, so it is recording. Um, so hello, everybody. Today we want to talk about our um, project, the Advanced Geo Partnership, a critical feminist approach to transforming workplace climate in the geosciences. I'm Erica Marin Spiota, professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I'm Christine Bell. I'm an evaluator at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So we'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dijop since time immemorial. The Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory in 1832. We commit to acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this and all territories. We commit to honor and respect the many indigenous people still connected to the lands from which we gather remotely. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that connect us together today. And this is especially important when we think about um, the problems that our project is trying to address, which are that bias, discrimination, and harassment present serious hurdles to diversifying the earth and space sciences. And these behaviors um, persist due to a number of factors, including historical structures of exclusion in our scientific disciplines and our academic institutions, severe power imbalances in academia, unique challenges associated with white male heteronormative and ableist geoscientist stereotypes, and a culture of impunity that tolerates exclusionary behaviors that ultimately create hostile educational and workplace climates. And there's a lot of data to support the, um, the existence of hostile workplace climates in the geosciences, but really across all STEM disciplines. When we look specifically at some of the research that has been done in the earth and space sciences, we find um, gross underrepresentation of women really at all levels of the academic hierarchy. If we focus on faculty, about 20% of geoscience faculty are women. This is actually an improvement over data in the last 10 years, but most of this improvement has been enjoyed by white women. Women of color continue to be severely underrepresented in the discipline and today make up about 7% of faculty. Women of color received less than 2% of all PhDs over the last 40 years, and we actually haven't seen much of an increase um, over that time period. Some data showing um, exclusionary ex behaviors and, and um, experiences of violence during field work, which is an important component of a lot of training and research experiences in the geosciences found that uh, more than 70% of women doing field work experienced inappropriate comments, almost a third experienced assault, and the majority of these were trainees. And the major source of um, these types of behaviors were people in positions of um, supervisory power. So we start seeing the importance of recognizing um, academic hierarchies. Another study looking at um, astrophysics and astronomy community specifically um, found that 40% of women of color compared to 27% of white women felt unsafe because of their gender and almost a third of women of color felt unsafe because of their race. So we start seeing disproportionate impacts based on identity and these experiences were related with, um, had professional consequences. So um, women of color reporting, um, you know, skipping professional events, skipping professional opportunities, not going to classes, not going to workshops, not going to the field because of feelings of um, unsafety. So our project is trying to tackle this problem of hostile and exclusionary behaviors. And we're partnering with professional associations, um, academic institutions, um, to try to change the culture at all levels. And really, this is a problem that needs to be addressed at the individual level, thinking about individual behavior um, at the departmental level, um, at the institution level, within academia. And then we can use professional societies or associations um, and funding agencies to leverage culture change um, as well. So our project, the Advanced Geo Partnership, is funded by a National Science Foundation Advance Award, um, started in 2017. 
And the goals of our project are to develop and deliver bystander intervention and workplace climate training with scenarios that are relevant to um, the geosciences or other disciplines we might be working with and that incorporate and really center intersectionality. We're also collecting data on workplace climates and we've um, developed a workplace climate survey with organizational psychologists and we're developing educational materials that identify harassment as research misconduct. And finally, developing a sustainable model that can be transferred to other disciplines in partnership with professional societies. And so the main organizations we've been working with, this is actually a collaborative project um, across multiple institutions uh, in the United States. And we've been working with American Geophysical Union, which is the world's largest earth and space science society. Um, as well as the Earth Science Women's Network and Association for Women Geoscientists. And one of the first products that our project delivered is um, a community resources website with really useful information for thinking about um, identifying harassment, bullying, and discrimination in research environments, um, thinking about how you know, individuals and departments could respond to these behaviors, creating inclusive climates. We have really good um, resources for thinking about safety, inclusivity, and accessibility in field environments, um, as well as really good resources for developing codes of conduct. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our project approach. And we've um, been thinking about uh, critical feminist um, theory and how can, it can inform the work that we've been doing. And we found this to be really useful for understanding hostile workplace climates in the context of power, privilege, and discrimination. And we've been looking at intersectionality as a really important framework for guiding um, our work. And this has actually been um, a really, you know, really useful and, and actually very educational project because most of the, the research team are geoscientists. And most of us have actually not received formal training. Um, in sociology or psychology. So it's been um, really eye-opening um, to have this educational component um, um, of the project. And one of the um, interesting things about, you know, kind of the work that we're doing and specifically the resources website is, you know, we've been thinking about how do we translate this, these, um, this research for scientists so that we can actually incorporate it into our uh, everyday work. So intersectionality provides a really useful framework for thinking about problems of underrepresentation and inequities in STEM as a function of social injustice and oppression rather than related to individual identities. So this means that we can't just focus on, you know, mentoring and professional development of individuals, which is of course is really important, but we need to think about what is the, the climate of the organizations? What are the policies, the structures, the culture of the places where we're trying to recruit and retain um, people. And intersectionality really um, helped us actually expand and, and ultimately improve uh, the project itself to think about issues of diversity and equity in the geosciences beyond gender. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen some increases in the representation of gender um, of women, but this has only been afforded um, to women, you know, to white women. And so we really need to think about what are some of the other axes of identity um, that continue to be um, underserved in the geosciences. And it's also focused um, our attention to think, you know, beyond bias and think about what are exclusionary behaviors that actively create hostile climates. Um, and this is important for understanding some of these uh, persistent historical trends and underrepresentation in the geosciences. And so the focus of our project expanded from thinking about sexual harassment to hostile climates more broadly, including bullying, discrimination, um, you know, racism, and really um, you know, thinking about the disproportionate impact um, you know, experienced by people of multiple identities and that don't conform to these stereotypes that we have about geosciences. And intersectionality has also really been important, um, especially in this context of, of who doesn't conform to, gen to stereotypes um, of who are geoscientists when thinking about field safety, because it really makes us think about, you know, who is potentially more at risk um, 
of different type of exclusionary behaviors in different field research environments and thinking about, you know, um, with fields uh, being such an important component of research and training, that this is some, something that we need to really, um, you know, really center in our work as geoscientists. And we've been using a feminist ethics of care to inform our interventions. And we found this to be really useful um, because it kind of centers the role of social responsibility. And so, you know, we as geoscientists are part of a community. It is our responsibility to build accountability into our own behaviors, our colleagues' behaviors. It's our responsibility, um, how our students, our peers, um, you know, experience every day, our experience, our disciplines every day. Um, and it really kind of builds in this, uh, you know, sense of, of community to trying to make our workplace a better place for everybody. And so our main community-based intervention is focused on a bystander intervention uh, education programs. And we spend a lot of time making sure that our scenarios are relevant to the discipline so that um, they are relevant to the people in the room. Um, it's uh, rare that we have someone um, who, who doesn't relate to the particular scenarios that we're using. And we also have scientists or researchers as facilitators. So we are part of the community. We are participating in this education training. We can share our experiences. We can relate to the people in the room taking this uh, training. And the feminist ethics of care also informs um, our, our research practice throughout the whole project. We've also been focusing on research ethics, and this is specifically where the partnership with professional associations has been really fruitful. Um, where the American Geophysical Union recently revised their code of conduct to define harassment, bullying, and discrimination as research misconduct. And so we promote the development of codes of conduct for research teams, for departments, for organizations, um, and really kind of, you know, are, are, are you know, are trying to, to promote rethinking of what it, what it means to do ethical research and how these exclusionary behaviors actually ultimately have a negative impact on our research practice. And using professional associations as vehicles of change through um, changing you know, expectations of what it is to be a geoscientist um, through not rewarding this type of behavior with, with um, you know, awards and you know, scientific awards and, and recognitions, trying to use these organizations to change academia from without. And ultimately coming back to field safety, you know, thinking about safety in the field doesn't just include, you know, uh, what happens when you twist your ankle or, um, you know, you get bitten by, by a snake, but really thinking about field safety, including these interpersonal behaviors um, as well. And so Christine is gonna talk to us uh, about the impact of the workshops. Um, this is one of the main intervention um, you know, components of our project. And again, we're trying to promote bystander or upstander, you know, really community intervention. And, and we provide a suite of strategies um, that individuals and um, groups can utilize to um, interrupt the behavior and really more importantly, to support the people being targeted by those behaviors. And we also are working to engage leadership for um, institutional accountability. And all our work is centered on recognizing you know, the existence of power dynamics in these very hierarchical academic and STEM uh, environments. So I'll pass it over to Christine now. Okay, um, so Erica just gave a description of the problems that our project is designed to address and the approach of the project. So now I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the workshops and explain our evaluation methods and findings for the bystander intervention workshops. So the workshops are um, tailored to every audience. The facilitators have conversations um, with the organization that the workshops are being presented to. So the different types of audiences are academic departments and colleges. So faculty, staff, and graduate students, um, field research campaigns and training programs, professional society leadership and conference attendees, the workshops cover a lot of different topics, like Erica was just talking about. There's the 
suite of strategies for individuals and groups. Um, and some of the topics are harassment and bullying and other exclusionary behaviors. We don't just focus on sexual harassment and gender harassment. Um, and we talk about improving department climate, um, field safety, code of conduct, and um, our workshops are addressing implicit bias and microaggressions um, more often now. Um, so the, our workshop evaluation methods, immediately after the workshop, a short survey is administered to participants. The survey is anonymous and we used paper surveys prior to mid 2020 when the Qualtrics platform to administer the surveys when we moved to the virtual format. So this um, presentation, we combined both in-person and virtual responses because we didn't observe uh, much of a difference when comparing the in-person to the virtual responses. So I've combined them for this presentation. Um, so the survey was designed to capture multiple levels of participant feedback, such as their satisfaction with the quality of the workshop, changes in knowledge, and intention to use the strategies that they learn and practice during the workshop. Both quantitative and qualitative items are used to gather in-depth feedback. So initially participant responses from each workshop were aggregated and reported to the workshop facilitators in a timely manner. And this was usually done before the facilitators had their next workshop. And so this supported a continuous loop of feedback and improvement, um, which is sometimes referred to as formative evaluation. And that's one of the main goals of this evaluation. Um, we're also doing summative evaluation by um, with some of the survey results and we have plans for future research and publications that include further analysis of the qualitative responses and a six month follow up survey. So this presentation includes data from 47 workshops that were conducted between February 2018 and February 2021. All of the workshops were in a similar format and a similar length. Attendance is taken informally by observation and during the workshops and we estimate a response rate of 55%. Um, so the response rate was a little bit higher when we were using paper surveys in person. So sometimes um, now that we're doing the virtual online surveys, we use reminders sometimes. A little over half of the workshops were conducted for or with um, academic departments or research groups at universities. And other workshops were conducted during sessions at professional conferences or for society leadership teams. And um, five of the workshops in this data set are from field sites. Um, looking at the academic positions of respondents, 33% uh, are graduate students, 24% are faculty, and some of the other participants are staff, uh, researchers, and undergraduate students. Over half of our workshop respondents self-identify as female, 35% self-identify as male, and 1% self-identify as non-binary. During this presentation, uh, we will take a look at some preliminary descriptive outcomes from comparing responses by gender. So on the next slide, this bar chart here shows um, the majority of participants rate the overall quality of the workshops as excellent or good. And 99% of respondents said that they would recommend the workshop to others and 11 said that they would not recommend the workshop. And then the next two bar charts, these are from the virtual workshop participants. We added these two items to gain a better understanding of the quality of the workshop as an interactive online presentation and the quality of the small group discussions in the breakout rooms. The majority of participants rate both of these as good or excellent quality. Um, for for this project, um, since the goal is to educate participants by using content and scenarios that are relevant to experiences in their discipline um, and tailoring the content of the workshops to each audience is, very, is done very intentionally. Um, so this bar chart shows that 90% of respondents rate the scenarios as relevant or very relevant. Um, and when asked to describe why the scenarios are relevant, one faculty workshop participant explained that um, 
They said, I've been lucky to not have encountered this directly, but I've heard far too many cases reported or from colleagues where this occurred in my field. Um, and it's important for me to know what I can do. And a graduate student said, I have led field teams where this behavior has affected me personally and the team. Um, participants are also asked if they intend to use the bystander intervention strategies that they learn and practice during the workshop, and then to ask to explain why or why not. Um, so 90% of participants say that they will use the strategies. Um, one faculty participant said that even though they don't like confrontation, they still feel they now have the tools to intervene. A graduate student demonstrated understanding of the value of the strategies and said that they will use the strategies because they want to change the culture of the academy and it starts by actively using these strategies. Um, so an analysis of the qualitative responses from participants describing if they feel the facilitators approach encouraged participation and respectful conversation shows that 745 agreed with that description. Um, for example, one graduate student said, yes, the facilitators made it clear that the discussion is a safe place and all voices deserve the right to be heard. There were nine participants where their qualitative description was not so positive or they provided feedback for the facilitators. And there were about 14 responses that seemed uncertain. Um, for example, one faculty member said um, more of the small group or table discussions would activate more voices uh, because there are lots of power dynamics at play in the full room. Um, and then here are some preliminary descriptive data examining the differences in workshop experiences by self-reported gender. Um, so all there, although there are many more female participants than male participants, we are seeing similar effects for these two genders in terms of rating the quality of the workshop overall and rating of the quality of the facilitators. And then for the next two items here, um, we see that there's more differences between male and female ratings of the relevance of the scenarios with 46% of males saying that they are very relevant and 61% of females saying that they are very relevant. Um, and then 41% of males said that they will intend to use the bystander intervention strategies and more females, um, so 50% said they definitely will, um, or excuse me, compared to females where a higher percentage said that they definitely will use the scenarios. Um, so my final slide of workshop evaluation findings shows the changes in knowledge about key concepts. So after the workshop, participants were asked to rate what they perceived to be their level of knowledge before the workshop and where their perceived level of knowledge is at now. Um, so Wilcoxon sign rank tests were used to compare the means of these non-parametric match samples and all of the increases in self-reported knowledge are significant. Um, so participants report beginning the, the workshop with high levels of knowledge about the prevalence of harassment and exclusionary behaviors in research and academia and high levels of how structures allow hostile behaviors to manifest in research in academia, which demonstrates that participants are aware of the prevalence and aware of the problem when they are somewhat aware when they begin the workshop. And then it's interesting to compare that um, to participant levels of knowledge about the prevalence of the problems when coming in compared to their levels of knowledge about the strategies for addressing the problems. Um, so we see higher levels of knowledge about the problem and lower levels of knowledge about the strategies. So the item where participants stated the lowest level of initial knowledge is in stances taken by professional societies to address harassment. Um, and then we see a comparatively large increase in self-reported knowledge after the workshop. And then the item with the largest increase in knowledge is in the strategies for individuals to address harassment, such as bystander intervention. 
So in conclusion of these workshop um, evaluation findings, the advanced geo bystander intervention workshops are accomplishing the goals of delivering relevant and useful information and strategies to workshop participants. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, so our project started focusing on the geosciences um, and focused on three um, organizations, but we've actually been able to expand our network and expand our impact by partnering with other associations um, inside and outside the geosciences. And so we've had a number of associations participate in our workplace climate survey. Um, we've been invited to deliver our workshops to a number of conferences um, across STEM disciplines and also been able to develop really productive, um, you know, collaborations with uh, sociologists, psychologists um, to really think about, you know, how can we um, expand the model of our project to other disciplines for much broader uh, impact. And finally, um, we'd like to point you to our website if you'd like to learn more about the project hosted by CERC. Um, and think about how we can lead, um, you know, by example, treat others with respect, work actively as uh, members of our community to improve workplace climate, think about different ways we can support people targeted by these behaviors, educate ourselves about the problems and strategies that can be implemented at different uh, levels, and finally, think about how can we demand accountability of ourselves, our leaders, our community members, um, and speak out when we see an injustice. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.